Yeah, so I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Actually, I would have liked to show the PDF because I was uh, transfer from Mac to uh, PC, but anyway, so there will be a small glitches in terms of, of the, the typing. So I will talk about the impacts of 1.5 degrees on weather and climate extremes. And actually, I must say I also thought whether um, basically the topic should be avoided impacts because obviously the main question there is what type of impacts can we avoid when we aim at uh, keeping temperature warming at 1.5. On the other hand, as also Richard has mentioned, there could be some additional impacts from the 1.5 degree target in terms of mitigation scenarios. So two main questions. Uh, is the 1.5 degree target leading to a substantial change in extremes compared to present day warming? And is there a substantial reduction in extremes if you move, for instance, from two degrees to 1.5 degree warming? So actually, the first instance, what you can do is just look at uh, basically the attribution of changes in extremes and projected change in extremes to see which type of uh, change in, ex uh, in extremes you would expect to be influenced at this uh, level of warming. For this, we can look at as past assessment from uh, the IPCC. Uh, here, it's mostly based on the two recent reports, so the assessment report from 2013 and a special report on climate extremes, which I was involved in. So here I've uh, put together a summary of uh, assessed uh, observed change in extremes and projected change in extremes based both on the SREX and the AR5. And uh, basically I will discuss which one of those are most robust. And so basically what we can say from those past assessments is that uh, robust uh, change have been already observed for hot extremes, cold uh, extreme, and also heavy precipitation. So already now for one degree warming, we have seen an increase in the number of hot days, also the temperature of hot days, decrease in the temperature of cold days, and there have been more frequent heavy precipitation events. We also expect this to continue in the future, so that's why we can also expect that 1.5, there would be a substantial difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees. However, there is much more uncertainty regarding the attribution of, for instance, change in droughts. There we only have a medium confidence that there has been an increase in drought in some regions. And I should also say that there maybe we have to change some of the IPCC R5 uh, assessment because it was saying that it's likely that there will be an increase in drought in some dry regions. Actually, some new results suggest maybe that it shouldn't be stated in this way. So actually, that this dry region becoming drier, wet regions getting wetter is maybe not exactly correct, at least in many regions. Now, there are some changes in extremes which are very difficult to relate to greenhouse gas forcing at the moment. So we have actually low confidence regarding impacts of greenhouse gas forcing on changes in storms, floods, or tropical cyclones, if look, you look at the historical records. And also in projections, we have mostly low confidence. Just for floods, we know, of course, there is a link to change in heavy precipitation. So it's very difficult to say anything about impacts of the 1.5 degree target on changes in storms, floods, and tropical cyclones, but certainly we can say something about changes in hot or cold temperatures, in heavy precipitation, and maybe droughts. So the question here is, are there some difference between the 1.5 degree uh, target and higher scenario for those change in, in those extremes? Now, there were some first assessments from the AR5. Uh, for instance, I was here in Sunday Africa showing uh, the assessed uh, impact on extreme weather uh, event. I don't know if you see, yeah, you see the dots here. So basically, it was a kind of summary showing that probably between 1.5 and 2, we have a threshold going from moderate changes in extremes to high change. But it's more qualitative, and of course, it would be useful to have some quantitative assessments. We had a publication earlier this year with some colleagues trying to assess uh, this. So basically, looking at trends and simulation and looking at the changes in hot extremes and uh, also the change in heavy precipitation at 1.5 compared to other temperature targets. There, I wanted to go back to this figure from the AR5, which shows actually more or less a linear relationship between the global temperature change and emissions and uh, scenarios, so basically the cumulative emissions. Of course, this is very useful, but of what we would like to know is basically for some given cumulative emissions, what is the regional response, because that's where we have the emissions. That's uh, what we tried to do. And as, for instance, Valerie has shown, obviously the regional response is different from the global response. So, for instance, at 2 degree warming, we have a much stronger warming in many regions, the same thing at 1.5. So the question is, how does this look like at regional scale? So we did this type of uh, scaling uh, analysis 
what we are looking here on an x-axis at the change in global warming. So, and we are analyzing all the available scenarios. So basically here, we only have 8.5 and 4.5 simulation. But I should say that we have also redone this analysis with RCP 2.6 simulation. We find similar results. So on the y-axis, here you have the change in, for instance, the hot extremes in the Mediterranean. And here you have the change in global temperature. We have tried to relate this to cumulative CO2 emissions to make a link also to the actual emissions uh, into the atmosphere. What you see right away was, uh, is what I was saying before, that in terms of hot temperature at regional scale, we often have a much stronger warming. And that's, for instance, here in the Mediterranean. So at two degree warming, you have more than a three degree warming uh, in the Mediterranean. At 1.5, we see it's also more than two degree warming. So basically from this, you can compare the two degree versus 1.5 targets. 1.5 would be here, two degree would be here. You can also look at the local two degree or 1.5 targets. So I mean, one use of this type of uh, analysis is you can say we have seen before from the presentation of Richard that we can also infer local impacts, for instance, on crops. If we know that two degrees re regionally a critical uh, target, then you can infer what would be as the associated global warming. Here for the Mediterranean, if you have a two degree warming, regionally this means actually a 1.4 global warming. So we found an almost linear scaling for the multimodal mean. There were some previous results also pointing in this direction. We found a pattern independent of the emission scenario. So again, if you look at the multimodal mean, you see the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 almost uh, lie on top of one another. Here you look at the total range of the simulations. Of course, we're only looking at transient response. This is not looking at equilibrium simulations. And as mentioned, we can possibly also use this type of analysis to determine regionally motivated targets. So instead of starting from this axis saying what are the impacts of 1.5 or 2 degree, really starting from this target, is from this axis and saying what are the global impacts on regional scale and what does this imply in terms of global warming. Um, I just want to go back to one uh, figure or one uh, point that Valerie made that, for instance, you would expect some nonlinear change in some cases, maybe this seems uh, inconsistent. So this is from an article from uh, Reto Knutti and colleagues in literature of science, which is showing a nonlinear increase in the occurrence of hot days. Actually, those two analyses are totally consistent because the occurrence of hot days, so hot day is basically just defined versus a given threshold. And so if you have a fixed threshold, for instance, the 10% hottest days in present climate, even if you have just a mean warming in temperatures, then of course, the occurrence of exceedance above this threshold is going to increase nonlinearly. So you can have a linear dependence of the absolute temperature and a nonlinear increase in the occurrence of extremes. We looked also at other uh, changes in extremes. For instance, here at the change in minimum temperature, this is just analysis for the Arctic. That's one reason why we have very strong scaling. If you see at two degree warming or 1.5 degree warming, we have three times larger warming in the regional temperature. You can also look at change in heavy precipitation. That's for Southern Asia. We have substantial change in heavy precipitation. And there, despite the very large uncertainty range, so that's the total range of the simulation, I think we, I was quite surprised to see that still we have a more or less linear response, and again, not so much of a dependence on the emission scenario. One important question is, of course, this uncertainty range. So it's difficult to distinguish the two degree and 1.5 target if you have such an uncertainty range, because there, basically, it's difficult to distinguish the two. And so, of course, an important question is why are those scenarios so uncertain? One contributing factor, for instance, in latitudes for hot extremes is the impact of some ocean feedbacks. So you see, for instance, in the contiguous US at 2 degree, and at 1.5, it's actually 1.5, you would have more or less no change or even a cooling. And you can have a warming of up to uh, more or less 3 degrees. 2 degree, it's actually between 0 and about four degrees. In Central Europe, it's even worse. So for instance, at two degrees, you have anything between a warming of one degree and six degrees. And at 1.5, it's about, um, yeah, one degree to about five degrees. So there, of course, there is a difference between 1.5 and two degree target, but the uncertainty range is maybe the major issue. And we can find that uh, this is related to some more sure feedback. There is a poster on this topic by Marta Vogel, who is here. Now I want to go to uh, hydrological changes. This is uh, much more difficult, as I've discussed. So for drought change, uh, we, don't, we only have medium confidence that there has been an impact 
on drugs, maybe uh, on, on global scale. And just to illustrate this, I'm looking at changes in mean precipitation in P minus E. Again, the same type of display. So looking at the global temperature change here, and here's the change in uh, respectively precipitation of P minus E as a total available water uh, in the Mediterranean and Central Europe. These are analysis ongoing by Peter Grebe. Then we're looking at different uh, parts of the simulation. So first, the median of the simulation, the 90th percentile wettest and 90%, 10 percentile driest. What you see, for instance, is the Mediterranean is gets clear. Basically, we have a drying, and there is certainly a difference between 2 degrees and 1.5. Of course, this depends on which part of the simulation you are looking at. So some have a most, much more steeper change compared to others. Uh, it's even worse if you look at the, Medi uh, the Mediterranean for P minus C, so the total available water. You see that, for instance, at 1.5, Depending on which part of the simulation you are looking at, you may have no change between 1.5 and 2 degrees, while maybe it's already about 1 degree warming, so more or less now we had already 60% decrease in P minus C. Yeah, thank you. So I'll, shift, uh, I'll skip this uh, figure. I just want to come to the question of the mitigation scenarios and how do we get to 1.5. Richard mentioned this. And I think this is really a major issue and this should be discussed here as well. So there are a lot of assumptions about how we could get to, to this uh, target. One is a negative emission, so carbon capture and storage. The question is, this technology is not available at present, so we have to discuss this. Um, also, uh, the, those scenarios imply substantial changes in land use, as this was mentioned. So for instance, we need to have bioenergy, but what is the source of this? Would it be crops or forests? In which region would this occur? And basically, this impact of the land use scenarios would need to be better estimated. There could be negative aspects. There could be also positive aspects. So I wanted to bring up, for instance, the impact of its irrigation. We have uh, now some analysis ongoing looking at the impact of irrigation on temperature. And for instance, so just looking at the present day impact of irrigation, we find a cooling in many regions. So if we were to have more crop production, which is irrigated, if possible, in a sustainable way, we could also have regional cooling from this, and this is not assessed. So I come to the conclusions. Certainly, we can find some difference in extremes uh, between 1.5 and 2 degrees. There are robust results for hot extremes and heavy precipitation in many regions. Of course, some regions show a large spread in the response. Uh, we have large, large uncertainties for water balance and droughts, but the 1.5 versus 2 degree target actually affects the tail. So basically, if you look at the median, you don't have a very large difference. If you look at very dry scenarios, then you have a very large uh, change, and this could be quite relevant as well. Uh, for some extremes, uh, it's not possible to assess the impacts because there is too little uh, confidence in the attribution to greenhouse gas forcing. This is the case in part for floods, ex except for the part that is related to precipitation forcing, also for storms and tropical cyclones. So I think also an important topic, again, is that we need to contrast the benefits of the 1.5 targets versus the impacts of the mitigation pathways that lead us there. So there are substantial impact on land use. For instance, if we need to have biofuel production, which is competing with food production, there are changes in land cover and land use which need to be assessed because they also have impacts on the regional climate. And uh, of course, uh, whilst the negative emission is a major issue, we finally as also Valerie mentioned, I think we need to look at this in a combined way. So basically, at, at this level of uh, reduction of emission, we need to look at mitigation scenario, at adaptation scenario, and the impact on climate together. For instance, if we look at the impact of changing agriculture. Thank you.